Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, a three-time award-winning show that aims to motivate and inspire you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. If you're passionate about adventure, challenge and learning from women who have overcome obstacles and achieved remarkable things, then this is the podcast for you. Every Tuesday at 7am, new episodes go live featuring incredible women who share their stories, insights and tips to help you achieve your dreams and goals. You can support the Tough Girl mission by signing up as a patron. Visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash tough girl podcast. Keep listening until the very end as I share more information about what's going on with me with Tough Girl Challenges, give shout outs and recommend other Tough Girl podcast episodes. More information can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com. I am Beth and Taylor Swain. I am a PhD candidate at Birkbeck University of London, where I'm currently writing up my findings from a piece of research examining the representations and identities of women in ultramarathon. I very much talk about myself as a feminist sociologist of sport. And what that means is that I am an academic. So I work in an academic institution. I take an academic approach to all the insight that I create and share. It's underpinned by research. I'm a feminist. So I underpin all my work with a post-modernist feminist perspective, which is influenced by a couple of key theorists, Michael Foucault and Judith Butler are two of them for those who are in that world and know those people, but actually you don't need to know those people to understand the work that I do. I talk a lot about how gender is constructed and the idea that we are coached in society, influenced in society to perform certain gender roles and the impact that that has on our sport participation. I'm an activist, so I believe that you can't be a feminist academic without having an activist agenda. And my agenda is very much to help people understand more about the reasons that women don't participate in sports and adventure and physical activity. I'm a runner myself. I've run a number of marathons, half marathons, one ultra marathon. I'm hoping to do another next year. So I've got that identity as well. And then everything I do is about being engaged and reflective, so constantly asking questions, thinking about how I can improve my work, learning as new information emerges and developing my thoughts that way. And then crucially, I'm also a person, so I share quite a lot about my life on social media as well and my life with my family. I'm married. I've got a little girl who's two. My husband is very active as well. We've got a little dog called Loki who may or may not bark during this interview, depending on on his mood today. He he can take home security very seriously sometimes. And putting myself out there as somebody who's open and relatable and who likes to chat and to to really kind of be part of the community that I study in and that I participate in. When I was looking at your website, one of the first things that you share is your manifesto around energy and living well in the world, mindset, gratitude and connection. And I'd love for you just to tell us more about your your manifesto and how it came about and what that looks like. So this is something I came up with a few years ago. Um, and at the time, I was doing a lot of kind of well-being related advocacy. I briefly ran a consultancy with a friend of mine and a guy called Chevy Ruff, who's been a, a mentor for me for a number of years. And during that time, I really worked on reflecting on how I bring quality of life into everything that I do and what I need to thrive as an individual. So I started thinking about energy a lot more and the relationship between stress and energy. I have chronic mental health conditions, which I manage through medication. I've They've had a huge impact on my life at various points. At the moment, it's very under control, but I need to effectively manage them on a consistent basis. And this was all part of helping me kind of quote live well in the world through all of that. So I talk a lot about energy, about the balance between stress, rest and energy and the idea that you only have so much capacity for stress as an individual and that's physical and mental stress. So a great example is this last month 
last two months actually been really challenging for our family because my husband was out of work and that's a pretty scary time we were both kind of working out ways we could freelance more to make sure we had money that we needed to live and to minimize the disruption for our daughter and during that period of time kind of high anxiety high uncertainty my emotional stress levels increased so I reduced the amount of physical stress I was putting my body under I stopped running for a bit and sometimes that like for me, that's reached the point where it's intuitive, where I'm like, I just don't feel like it, so I don't do it. But sometimes it's also conscious. If I know that things are just really taking a toll on me mentally, I'm not going to go out and run and put my body under a load of pressure as well. So it's all about managing the energy that I have by effectively kind of managing the sources of stress and looking at where the stress is in my body and looking at where the stress is in my mind and, and weighing everything up so that I can kind of live well in the world, which was like the origin of that is that it was something my doctor said to me once that he, I went in for a checkup and he just went to look to me and went, so it seems like you're living really well in the world. And that for the last, I don't know, maybe four or five years has really been what I hold myself to when it comes to looking after myself. And looking after my well-being, it's like, am I living well in the world? Am I able to live the life that I want to live? Am I able to achieve the things that I want to achieve? Am I able to be productive, participate in my community and fundamentally be content and enjoy myself? So the whole of my manifesto is orientated around that. So again, mindset, gratitude, connection feed into that. I realized a number of years ago, I was a bit of a sponge for other people's emotions. I'm just one of those people. If other people are kind of moaning and stressed and down, I'll pick up on that. So it was things like, okay, who do I choose to surround myself with? How do I choose to approach different situations? How do I practice gratitude in my life? How do I make sure I stay connected with people? Because connection is huge for human well-being. So all of that comes together. And then movement. So as much as movement can put us under stress and at high stress, high psychological stress, there are periods of stress, it can be really tough. It's always got a place in my life, being outside and being moving, whether that's walking, running, on my bike, swimming, whatever, is is huge. Like I know that I feel better when I'm outside. I know that I feel better that when I'm in nature. Like when my two-year-old is upset, I often find myself saying to her, okay, we're just going to go outside and then you'll feel a lot better. And it works. And it's going to, like, we live in central London, but we still find ourselves kind of going to green places and being outside and making that huge part of our life as well. And that has had a phenomenal impact on my well-being um, over the years. You know, you mentioned that movement is really important to you and that you've been running for quite a while what was your journey into running what did that look like so my journey into running as I know it now started about 10 years ago maybe 10 11 years ago I was in my late 20s I was not particularly happy in my life at the time I was in quite a difficult relationship I was kind of quite alienated I was doing I was in a very stressful job it just felt like quite a bleak time really but I knew I needed a hobby and I tried all sorts of different things and they all failed miserably. Like I'm not a baker, let's put it that way. But the thing I kept coming back to was running and I'd always been fantastically rude about running. I did not see the point in running. Why would you want to do that? It's, it's just ridiculous. But because it kept coming back to me, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to go and give this a go. So I went out and bought myself a sports bra. And as soon as I'd spent, like we all know how expensive sports bras are. As soon as I I'd done that I was like right okay I'm committed I have to get the wear out of this and yeah I started running and it started just on a it wasn't couched at 5k I used it was like some women's running like beginner's plan I went out after dark in like my old school t-shirt and kind of went for a run and it was the first run I knew that it was going to change my life because it just made me feel something it made me feel really good but it also made me feel really capable And like I had potential and I don't think I'd really, I don't think I was feeling that at that point in my life for a lot of reasons. And yeah, from there, I kind of started doing more of it and I started 
getting better at it. I entered a race, which I really enjoyed. And then I gradually, you know, got up the courage to go to a Greek run and kind of all that type of thing. I ran with some friends and gradually, gradually built up. And then I saw, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I could run a half marathon. And that felt outrageous. But I signed up for it anyway. And then I ran this half marathon and I saw my friend Leah run a marathon. I was like, well, if she can do it, I could do it too. It just kind of rolled from there. And there's been times where I've run less for various reasons. I ended up doing a master's degree part time while working and running didn't really fit into life at that point. I took part in the speed project a few years ago and that was so intense and I got injured that for a while afterwards I just didn't have the best relationship with running but the beautiful thing about running is it's like a boomerang it always comes back so I've kind of learned that if I'm not feeling it for whatever reason if I set it to one side it will always come kind of flying back to me so April this year I ran my first post baby marathon I was one of the women who benefited from the new pregnancy deferral rules that London introduced. So they sort of deferred for a couple of years, did that in April. And that was huge for me because through my pregnancy, I'd been really unwell. And one of the things that kept me going was I knew I had this ballot place for London Marathon that I'd be able to use once the baby was born. It was one of my goals when I spoke to my nurses and my doctors I had a huge team. I I had a lot of quite serious complications. And I remember like being in high dependency and talking to my nurse about this. And in April to be able to send email in like a picture of me and my baby with my London Marathon medal at the end was so huge for me. It was it was enormous. It was just like the best feeling in the world that, you know, this was a year and a half after I'd had these horrible complications and surgery and all sorts of things to be able to be doing this was just immense you know now I'm trying to finish up my PhD so again running long distances has kind of dipped I'm just doing kind of 30 minutes here and there to keep things ticking over but I know it will come back and the next big goal will be to do a 50k at a time that's right for me to do a 50k and in the meantime yeah I'll just kind of be around the running community I'm I'm very lucky that I do a lot of work at races I do kind of event management work at races which is great and get to spend lots of time around runners lots of my friends are runners it's a big part of our family life and our social life so I've still always got it in the background even if I'm not actually getting many miles in myself I'd love you to take us back and maybe just share a little bit more about the challenges and the journey of getting back into running and the process that you used did you know did you have enough knowledge yourself to develop your own training plan did you go back into a running club did you work with a coach you know how did you manage that with like your postpartum recovery it was quite a long process for me I had a cesarean section I had an emergency cesarean as well which I actually healed really well from and I returned to physical activity at six weeks Now, what that actually meant was doing lots of breathing exercises to re-engage my core. I went to lots of postnatal classes with kind of real postnatal specialist trainers. There's a gym very close to where I live where a friend of mine called Frankie Holler, she's a great postnatal trainer. I trained with her three times a week in her mums and babies strength classes for a few months to basically re build my strength because I hadn't just been pregnant I'd also my body had gone through kind of a serious illness as well as just being pregnant I'd lost a lot of strength I hadn't been able to be physically active for a lot of my pregnancy so we were starting at a pretty kind of low base I did that I did yoga I did pilates anything to basically re-engage my core and get me a bit more comfortable I was restricted to a certain degree. I couldn't do lateral movements for quite a long time because of my scar. I've had a lot of nerve damage across my abdomen as well. So that kind of made things a little bit interesting. But the benefit of working with somebody who's an expert in postnatal training is they know all this stuff. They understand it all and you adapt and work on different things and let things recover gently. I had my daughter in the August and I did my first run back on her four-month birthday 
I did Couch to 5K, NHS app, Joe Wiley in my ear, kind of coaching me through it. It was all very gentle, felt pretty good. Like I gave myself a lot of grace because when you've got a very little baby, life is a little bit chaotic. So I, if I missed a session, it was fine. I'd catch it up. I also went back to work when she was four months old. So I was doing both of those things. So it was a little bit kind of challenging, but I'd be, I was so excited to get back to running. I think I'd last really trained properly for something in April 2019. And this was kind of a solid kind of 18 months later. I'd had a baby. I recovered from an injury that I'd sustained back in 2019. And I was really ready to go mentally. At that point, London hadn't quite introduced the new maternity policy. So I was actually due to run the marathon in October 2022. So I started marathon training. That didn't exactly go to plan. And it's a great illustration of why the new policy from London Marathon is so important, because it was just a bit too much too soon. And I ended up with an injury that was related to my C-section incision. Because, again, because it was an emergency, it's a little bit off centre. So there's some tightness over one of my hips. And basically doing kind of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 mile runs that tightness was causing problems and I um, injured my piriformis. So I had to bow out of London in October 2022. It was gut-wrenching because I didn't know if I'd qualify for the new deferral. Luckily, London said, yes, I could defer until April 23, which was amazing. Preston up, recovered from that piriformis injury and at around the same time the guys at Cooper Run Coach reached out to me and it kind of Jordan one of their coaches I've known for a long time she's also returned to running following a c-section after having her little girl we're friends and she was just like come and train with us come and use our app we we think you'd be a great ambassador for us but also I think it really help your training I was like yeah okay I trust you you know what you're doing And I did exactly what they told me on that app every single session, give or take. There are a couple that for infant related sickness reasons I couldn't do. And we kind of rejigged a few things and they were really flexible and supportive around that. But I just did what they told me. And I'm a qualified personal trainer. I've got a lot of running experience. I could have done my own plan, but actually that can take up a lot of headspace. And a little kid, I'm trying to write a PhD the most sensible thing for me in terms of managing my energy was to outsource and use the app and use the coaching expertise. And it was amazing. I got to the start line with no injuries. I felt strong. I felt confident. That race was, I think, the best race I've ever done. It was amazing. It was just so good. And it wasn't like I I talk a lot about, I don't put much stock in times. It's not what I'm about. What I'm about is finding joy in running and your joy PB, which I can't take credit for. I stole it from Tina Mia, but it's such a great way of encapsulating a running experience. And London was my ultimate joy PB. I paced consistently, which if you're a bit of a nerd, is the best thing ever. I felt good. I felt strong. The weather was perfect for me. I enjoyed it. I saw so many of my friends and family on the course. I just had, I came off, I felt at the end, I had probably had another 10K in me, to be perfectly honest. And it just felt really good. It was amazing. It was perfect. I love that. And I love the, the joy PB as well. That's fantastic. That's great, isn't it? I love yeah. that. I love that. Did you have like a race strategy or a plan for how you were going to, to tackle it? Yes. I took that really seriously. I had a written plan. It was highly detailed. I knew exactly what I was doing when I was doing it. My fueling, so um, I'm good friends with Charlie Watson, uh, the runner beans, she's a dietitian. She gave me some fueling tips, which were absolutely flawless. I did exact, again, did exactly what she told me to do. And it worked amazingly. I feel far more than I'd ever fueled before. And it just worked out so well. It was all down to what I was going to wear, what socks I was going to wear, which of my shoes I was going to wear, how I was going to get to the start line what was in my drop bag, you know, how soon before my start time was I going to eat my like three fingers of shortbread that I eat before every race? What 
fuel was I going to take when when was I going to introduce caffeine when was I likely to see friends and family because that's for me that's actually a really important having that to look forward to knowing that you know I was going to see my mum my husband my daughter at point x that I was going to see my mates from run through at point y that I was going to mile 21 with run down crew being able to look forward to each of those points was really important so yeah I wrote it down I had a plan I knew exactly what was happening I knew exactly what my pacing needed to be at each point where I would be deliberately holding back on pacing where I would allow myself a bit more leeway on pacing I walked for a minute every 30 minutes kind of a run walk strategy and that's when I had my fuel and it was kind of when would I need to refill my soft bottles because I run with a kind of racing vest because I don't really like water stations they get a bit chaotic so when was I going to be able to use that what what audio book was I going to listen to all those things were thought about in advance I knew exactly what I was doing it's so nice when a plan does go to plan yes <laughs> and it's not like everything disintegrates and you're just like no. what, what is going on exactly and it it saves you so much emotional energy for me if I'm going to be out on the road for five hours or more I need to manage my energy I don't need to be thinking oh shit where's my socks where are my socks I need to know that okay this is what's going to happen and for also for me being somebody who you know, I have high functioning anxiety. And again, having a plan, knowing what's going to work does help me manage some of the more kind of let's say overthinking, but some of the tendencies that come with having a brain that works in a particular way. I love the um the outsourcing actually. It's it's something that I do with my training. I realized when I was training for marathon disasters go way back in like 2016, that I just Oh, yeah, it was just t- too much, and I ended up overtraining because I just didn't know what was good for for my body. So now I'm literally just like, I speak to my personal trainer, I say, "This is what I'm doing," and explain it to them in detail so he knows. And then he goes away, comes up with a plan, and it's just like, "This is what you need to do." I'm like, "Good, you just you just tell me, give me the plan, I will follow the plan," and that's what that's what I want to do. You don't have to make decisions. Yeah. And as long as you've got a coach who shares your values, yes, who knows you, like, again, the Cooper app was great for me because I could kind of adjust it. So I do all my long training runs in the week because that's when I have childcare. Um, so what I would do is I'd go drop my daughter off with her grandparents in an Asda car park and they take her off. And I'd go for a run in like Richmond Park, Wimbledon, kind of go and do trail runs for a lot of my training my plan I was able to kind of tweak it all so that it would work with that rather than the kind of traditional long run at the weekend kind of vibe and again being able to message the coaches because it's not personal coaching in kind of one-to-one coaching it is an app it's driven by an algorithm but there's a personal coach behind it so you can message them and I kind of go x y and z has happened what do you advise I do and knowing that those people had the same outlook on training as I did and that I could trust them to give me really sensible advice just worked really well for me it was great and it was one way of reducing the mental load that comes with training because it is a huge burden I'd love you to share a little bit more maybe about your PhD journey and how that's linked in with ultra running and women um yeah once I realized I had a passion for not just for running itself but for the running community and for women in running that's really where the passion really lies for me I knew that I wanted to kind of I guess a career to dedicate myself to being an authority in that area and if you know me very well, this is not at all a surprise. Obviously, the way I was going to do that was to go and do a master's and study it. Like, no kind of messing around with, oh, I'll go and work in X, Y, No, no. I was going to go and do a master's. Did a master's part-time while working full-time in the city at Birkbeck University of London. I studied sports management because that was the course that was available that fitted with everything else that was going on in my life. From the day dot, the whole department was so supportive of me. They let me tweak as much as I wanted to focus more on the sociology of women in sports. It was so interesting. And then I wrote my master's dissertation on women in ultra running, and it was called You Got Chicks, Representations and 
identities of women in ultramarathon. And I did a media analysis of images of women from the Speed Project, so Team Moselle, who were an OG team of six, an analysis of interviews with runners who participated in ultramarathons. It was really well received. I won the best dissertation, not just for my course, but for the the School of Management at Birkbeck for that year. And I'd already been toying with, did I want to do a a PhD? And I was encouraged to apply again to Birkbeck and was very lucky to be awarded a studentship to essentially research what I'd already started. So I started that a few years ago now. It's been a bit disrupted because of COVID and having a baby and and various bits and pieces. It's a, a very challenging way of life at times. But yeah, I progressed that work, left my job, started full time at that work. And again, my, my thesis has the same title now. It's slight, it looks slightly different from how it did seven years ago, but it's called You Got Checked Representations and Identities of Women in Ultramarathon. And it's an analysis of about 40 odd interviews with men and women in the UK predominantly who participate in ultramarathon and amateur level. I asked them about their experiences. I wanted to understand in ultramarathon, we've got this idea that the sport is very inclusive and that it's a great place for women in particular. A lot of stats often get thrown around about how women are going to outrun men at ultra running over long distances and that type of thing. And really, I was interested in testing whether or not that was true and whether or not there was anything we could take and apply in sport more widely. Because much as I want more women to take part in running an ultramarathon, I want more women to take part in sport and physical activity or stop. I want every woman to feel like it is for them. And that's become even more acute to me now. I have a, a little two-year-old daughter is I want every girl that she represents to feel like sport is for them and that it's not a boy thing, it, that enjoying the outside, benefiting from it physically, mentally, emotionally, everything, the friendships, the community, that that is for them and at the moment we're really not in a place where that is true so that's kind of what's driven it in terms of the findings of the research at the moment I'm writing them up and a lot of the work that I do is looking quite critically at the narratives we use to discuss women accessing sports and specifically ultramarathon but more more generally sports and the idea of well if I if I can do it anybody can do it and you just have to want it badly enough and these these very post-feminist narratives around participation, which are actually potentially quite exclusionary in themselves. So I look quite critically at that type of thing. I'm not a physiologist. Um, I have many, many talented colleagues who are across the kind of women in sport world. I did do a brief review of the literature around the, the kind of physiology of women in ultramarathon and whether or not women will outrun men. And at the moment, there's just not enough good research to make any conclusions it's looking actually quite unlikely at the moment the women who are very high performing are possibly the exception there's just not enough women in the sport to really know kind of from a a conclusive research perspective whether or not that will happen in terms of inclusion in the masses as much as you get the masses in ultramarathon but kind of normal runners in ultramarathon it's again kind of my conclusions are erring towards the idea that the women in the sport are probably the exception they're there by permission because they can adopt particular narratives they have particular life they are afforded particular lifestyles I mean there's a socio another sociologist sports guy called Neil Baxter who talks about running as being a white middle class sport and that rings very true in ultramarathon although there are some fantastic groups doing amazing things to increase diversity. Black trail runners is one that always comes to mind in the trail space. Uh, Sabrina and Sonia are doing phenomenal work there. But as it stands, probably more conventional in terms of gender relationships than I think we would like to acknowledge generally. Yeah. When do you think you'll finish your PhD? Is it as the plan for it this year? And the million dollar question. So, I'm sorry, is that the, that's one of the first um, <laughs> questions to ask a PhD first <laughs> candidate, isn't it? Sorry. My father-in-law asked me that yesterday and I was like, oh, um, no. So I was actually due to submit it around about now because of family stuff. I had to take my foot off the gas for a bit, which luckily I'm able to do. My university supported me doing that. I'm hoping end of the year, very early next year. 
I want to be a doctor in 2024. I want you to be a doctor in 2024 as well. I also kind of want to, you know, have a bit more time to spend with my family, but also kind of do other work. It's great, but it's very lonely sitting and writing. I want to be out in the community. I want to be around runners. I'd quite like to do a bit more running myself. And at the moment, I'm very much chained to a desk and kind of reading and writing all day, which is great, but it's not what ultimately fulfills me. What ultimately fulfills me is communicating that knowledge in a way that's accessible, working with runners, spending time with runners, influencing races, doing all that type of thing. Is there anything that you sort of discovered which you were quite sort of like shocked by or that you weren't expecting? Not really. I think the thing that has really changed for me over year, over the years is really starting to understand kind of post-feminism and the impacts of how we talk about running. And that's something I, I talk about a huge amount on social media is the way we talk about sports and, and running specifically really, really matters. Because a lot of the narratives that we take for granted are very exclusionary. So this idea of running is free. Well, it's not free. It's just not. And it's not free in a number of ways. You know, it requires resources, whether they're time, money, the feeling of safety, all those things are required. And a lot of them actually predominantly affect women or minorities. Personal safety is a huge thing for women in running. We're going into winter now. We don't have loads of academic literature on women's experiences of safety in running, but Runners Worlds have done some fairly okay surveys on it. I think I wrote a blog post on it actually. And whether or not you feel safe running is going to really influence whether or not you run. Like I live in central London, I live in Brixton. I don't always feel safe running at night. I do a lot of the time because I'm fairly reckless as a human being and don't think too hard about these things. But that's me. That's that's my personality as an individual. That's not the broad experience of women we know that we know based on research, based on insights. Crimes against women over the last few years have been so like some of the crimes committed against women, very ordinary women we can all identify with, have been horrific. And that adds to the narratives around women's safety. It's, do you feel comfortable going out? Will you be catcalled? Do you feel like you can wear headphones? You know, do you feel you need to carry a personal alarm? What's affecting your choices about movement in terms of your personal safety? Even what we wear, like to run comfortably, I wear leggings and clothes fitting top. Now, whether or not everybody feels comfortable wearing that in a public space is a question and if you don't feel comfortable in what you're wearing when you're running you're going to run less affordability I feel like shoes and sports bras just seem to get like I was talking about my husband needs new running shoes and we actually couldn't afford to buy them at one point because they're so expensive that's an exclusion factor for a lot of people it's not just yeah Every time, whenever I bring this up, I do have people say, oh, well, you can run barefoot. It's like, yeah, but most people aren't going to because of social norms. And, you know, if you're feeling like you're kind of mustering up your courage to go and do something that you wouldn't normally do, adding the dimension of not wearing shoes to do it in is probably a bit beyond. It's kind of thinking about those layers. So sports bras are so important, but they often get overlooked and they're really expensive. So particularly with younger women but actually all women it's having confidence to go and know where to buy a sports bra get fitted for a sports bra and to be able to afford it and again I was looking at them this weekend they're about 40 quid which is a lot of money so there's those layers and there's also the time factor so if you're working all day you've got some little kids or even bigger kids to be honest you've got the stress that cost of living is increasing there's lots of stress anxiety all sorts of things swirling around in your world making time to run actually probably isn't going to be your priority when are you going to fit it in what negotiations are you going to have to make that work I feel that my situation is particularly privileged because I have a partner who also runs and we take it in turns for who trains for what and during those times prioritize each other's training and yeah it makes it happen but there is a lot of compromise with training and getting out to run and getting out 
to go to the gym or, or do X, Y, and Z. And it's, it's not necessarily simple for people, but we as a society and as women and women in sport, and I see a lot from women in sport already, we kind of overlook the praxis that exists in society and the diversity of experiences in society and can kind of start throwing around kind of quite reductionist ideas which are probably valid on an individual or a small scale basis. But if we're looking at wider questions of inclusion in sports and encouraging more women to become involved in sport, we actually have to be really mindful of because they can almost have the reverse effect of alienating people or making people feel even more like sports is not for them. If you've got like, you know, a conventionally attractive woman who has no children and a flexible job saying, well, I did it you can definitely do it that's actually not as inspiring as perhaps it's portrayed to be sometimes one of the things that I've been trying to move away from is so at the end of the podcast episode I always ask women for their you know final words of wisdom final words of advice I think I'd done like four or five interviews in a week and and this isn't the women's fault by the way but no every, every single woman at the end of the episode their advice was just do it and it really made me think because I was like especially like you said it's sometimes it's not that easy to just go out and do it and this is obviously you know <laughs> I'm talking from a very privileged position in terms of I have the freedom and flexibility with with time if it's like oh I can just pop out in the middle of the day if I need to do like a, a big a big run or something and, and it really made me think and now at the end of the episode I have to caveat like the final words of advice say please don't say just do it like it needs to be something else which is more I suppose not more manageable but something more practical than just the yeah just do it anyone can do it because it's like no not anybody can do it if you've got children health problems or you know elderly parents stressful jobs there's a sometimes there is a lot going on in the world (laughs) life is absolute chaos most of the time I don't think it's anybody's fault that we I would never blame anybody for saying just do it like this is a social construct we are fed this through ideology in our society that if we want something you just have to work hard enough and then you'll get it you know you just need to sacrifice and then you'll get it but quite often that model that perspective is from a traditionally masculine point of view because our society whether we like it or not has historically privileged men and women have historically been pushed into positions to support men's success whether or not that is football being banned in the UK because we were too good at it, whether or not that's concerns about women's well-being, whether or not that's women taking on kind of, again, culturally through kind of cultural norms, taking on more of the load at home, the impact of child rearing and being pregnant kind of does distort all those things as well. It's Our society has historically been framed around supporting men to succeed even sports sports as we know it from the victorian era was very much about training men to be soldiers and controlling working populations so that they could serve the powerful more effectively let's keep them out of the pubs basically that's why so many football teams are associated with churches or industry was because they're a way of keeping the working men busy so that they didn't go off and become drunks Our whole society is based around helping already privileged men succeed. Again, that's no criticism of men today. That's no criticism of women today. That's generations and generations and generations of ideology in our society having an effect. And it affects all of us. You can be as awake to it as you want, but you'll still find yourself having those little thoughts. You'll still kind of find yourself kind of behaving in certain ways or having certain expectations it's part of how our society is structured and the power relations in our society and again it's not overt power in the way of I want to lord it over you it's much more subtle than that it's about the power dynamics of how society is structured run and in the service of whom so whenever I say power people get defensive and it can sound quite menacing I suppose to say power but actually it's much more subtle than that and it's not really about power in the kind of fighting wars over at power it's it's much much more subtle about who who benefits from a situation the most and we're not necessarily even 
aware that it's happening most of the time. It's very ingrained. So it's all that type of thing that does kind of systemically disadvantage women. Is it really difficult? Uh, but the playback from that is we've become so subsumed in this cultural ideology that if we just work hard we can overcome anything and it's going to be great and some women do for all sorts of reasons that we continue to perpetuate these ideas that it's not about the structure of society it's just about whether or not you want it hot enough and work hard enough and they're two quite different things so it's what I kind of try to get at with a lot of the work that I do is that let's look a bit more deeply at what's going on here and step back from well I did it and I just worked hard or if you want it, you can do it and get, okay, what structural stuff is going on here? How is society failing to serve us? And that's not just as women, that's, or as, as minority groups, that's everybody, because actually without equality also benefits men, because we also, like, it's not my area of specialty at all, but, you know, masculinities and masculinity and ideology around masculinities can be incredibly harmful as well. So it's, how do we step back and how do we look at what's governing people's choices and behaviours and how do we resolve that by being a little bit more aware of them and questioning situations a little bit more? I was definitely brought up on the, if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything. Yeah. And I have to say for, for many years, I just could never understand why people just, well, if you want something, why don't you just go after it? Like sign up for the, like, I literally, I just couldn't get my brain around it. And I think it's only sort of recently, it's like, Sarah, it is your massive privilege that you can do these things because you've got good health, a loving family, a su- supportive family, you know, being able to live rent free. Not, I don't need to earn huge amounts of money to have the freedom to live the life that I want, but it's so privileged. And that actually, it's, I even think back to when I was training for Marathon de Sars, I was fortunate enough to train over in, um, in Australia and, uh, like, and I was pretty broken most days. And like, in terms of I'd wake up, I'd do my five hours, I'd come back, I'd have my bath, I'd do my stretching, I'd have my protein shakes, there'd be dinner on the table sort of thing, I'd walk the dogs, and then I'd sleep for like eight, nine hours. All I had to do when I was in Australia training was run and eat and sleep. It was so, there was no other I had no worries. I had no stresses. I had no concerns. I wasn't worrying about paying the bill or doing the food shop or cooking the dinner. And like when you start, I, I was actually recently back in Australia, very different circumstances this time because my brother's now got three kids, three dogs. There was just like a lot going on. I wasn't training for anything, but I was broken. Like I couldn't, I could not have trained for Marathon de Sables this time around because I don't know what, when I would have fitted it in. Like you'd have to be up at like four thirty in the morning running, and then back to help with the kids. And then, like when I do hear of like women who are, you know, exactly like you you mentioned earlier, you know, you're working a full time job, you're studying for your for your masters, and and you also got you know a partner and a family. That's a lot going on to try and balance these different elements of yeah. of being a human and existing and and trying to make it it work. It's so often it's like, well, just get up earlier or do X or do Y. It's like, well, actually, you can only do so much. Yes. And as I said, that's why I've cut back running at the moment is I'm trying to write up a PhD. I've got a two-year-old. We've got enough going on in life. I work part-time as well. And it's, you know, actually something's got to give. And right now, going out and running for five or six hours is probably the thing that needs to give. And that's okay because it'll still be there in a a year or so once this is eased off and I can make that a priority again. I think particularly for women of our generation, there is a kind of cultural drive to do a lot yeah, and to excel at a lot. You can have it all. That's what we were brought up on. Exactly. You can and- have it all. I can't remember. <laughs> oh, there was a, she was a banker who had nine kids or oh, six my- kids and and she Goodness, had, yes. that was that came out when I was 18, I feel, or 18 or 19. And I feel as though that really impacted me that yes, you can be a high flying, successful career woman, you can be super fit, you can have a family, you could you can have it all. <laughs> I mean, you can have it all if you can afford help. Yes. If you can afford lots of help, like a housekeeper and nanny and stuff, you can absolutely have it all. But otherwise, <laughs> you, I know. You can't have, have all at the same choices. time. No, you can't. And 
but actually that's okay because do you really want to do everything all at once or do you want to kind of maybe enjoy life a little bit and not put yourself under so much pressure because again it comes back to what we're talking about at the beginning with energy you only have so much energy and you know if you want to live well in the world and enjoy your life sometimes you've got to balance that energy and it might be that at at point x actually the work that you're doing is so important to you you want to channel a lot more of your energy into that so you're going to chat to your partner you're going to say listen this is my priority at the moment are you able to take on a bit more at home can we can we do do a bit of a balance shift at home and that's what we did when I was training for London Marathon my husband ran the household normally we split things and he took on a lot more of the load at home and a lot more of the kind of child management load at home sometimes it will be actually I really want to invest some time with my family and you step back on other things and sometimes it'll be like actually what's important at the moment is running so I'm going to make that a priority and I'm going to work out how I can fit fit that around other things and look at how I train and and that type of thing so it's really balancing it and deciding what your priorities are your priorities can't be everything and that's a very hard lesson to learn for particularly women of our generation that's not putting women's capabilities down it's kind of acknowledging that we've probably been missold a lot and that we have a social system that really lets women down because we still have a gender pay gap. We have ineffective childcare and quite often the default is that that lands on women. So like we love our child money, she's amazing, but we've told her many, many times that I am not the person you call if there is a problem. Who does she always call when there's a problem? It's me because I'm the mum. All my daughters, because I gave birth to my daughter, all her NHS stuff is set up under me. Fair enough. But actually, like for administrative, you can see why they do that on Labour Ward. It kind of makes sense. But it's from that they dot default for her medical care becomes me. So there's lots of things that kind of conspire against us as to why we can't have it all. And perhaps the way that our male counterparts have because you do see you do see dads who somehow magically managed to have a pretty successful career I know a number of fathers with quite considerable cycling habits and they spend time with their family but who's facilitating that how is that being facilitated yeah yeah and again that's not all relationships I know my relationship that's not the case our lives are so chaotic that actually it probably wouldn't work because we both work freelance and do x and do y and train and the kid comes along too but we also know that that's not realistic for a lot of people. And it's about just looking critically. It's not looking critically at individual women. It's looking critically at the social systems, which hold women in this pattern, which continues to facilitate men thriving. Bethan, where's the best place for people to connect with you to find out more about the work and to read more about your social media posts, especially from the feminist sports sociologist? Uh, where should they find you on the socials? I'm most consistently available on Instagram. So Beth and Taylor Swain is my personal Instagram handle. Uh, it's where I talk about my own running, but also about lots of other things as well. I have recently set up a new Instagram account called Feminist Sports Sociologist, which is very much focused on my more academic work and the advocacy work that I do. So there's only a few posts up there at the moment, but... It's kind of explaining uh, perspectives on misogyny, the impact of race cutoff times and how they can systemically disadvantage women, but about what it means to be a feminist sociologist. So I'll be gradually growing that. And then I have a website, which is bethandtaylorswain.com, where I post blog posts. I'm not writing as much there at the moment because I'm writing my thesis and there's only so much writing a woman can do in a day. But over time, there'll be more content. And there's, there's a reasonable back catalogue there as well. Fantastic. I'll make sure I put all of those links in the show notes. But Bethan, I'd love for you to have the final words of advice, final words of wisdom for our listeners. I mean, you can take this in any direction that you would like, but please don't say just do it. Anything else apart from that? If you care about wanting more people to enjoy sport and physical activity, examine what your privileges are when it comes to sports and physical activity and dismantle those first and then think about how you can support others. It's a process. You won't always get it right. That's okay. But avoid platitudes and instead think about what you can do to understand your journey better 
and what might have helped you on your journey. Beth, and thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast. It's been incredible to speak to you and just best of luck with the final push on the PhD. Thank you. Hey Tribe, I really loved our conversation with Beth Ann. I love this mix of running with the academic side and the fact that new knowledge is being developed to add to what we know. So I'm actually really enjoying following along with Beth Ann on social media and getting to hear more of her views. And everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes. So there'll be links to all of her social media, etc. there. So please do go and follow along with Beth Ann to learn more about her love of running and also all the academic side of stuff. It is honestly really, really fascinating. During this podcast, Rebecca mentioned black trail runners and we've previously spoken with one of the co-founders Sabrina Pace Humphreys who came on the podcast she actually been on the podcast twice she first came on the podcast on the 7th of July 2020 and also in August on August 30th 2022 so those episodes are well worth listening to but next week we will be speaking to Rebecca from Black Trail Runners who's going to be sharing more about her trail running journey and what can you expect from this episode let me tell you more so Rebecca's story starts in the northeast of England where she grew up on a small holding in an area with very little ethnic diversity She was influenced by her mum's passion for animals and she pursued a dream of becoming a vet and moved to Liverpool for university. As a young mum, she discovered tennis and joined a fitness group before her journey led her to running. Residing at the foot of the Pennines in West Yorkshire with her husband and two children, Rebecca turned to running in 2021 as a way to escape life demands of a busy family life and the stress of running a veterinarian practice during COVID. In 2022, she set her first trail race goal, a 16 kilometer trail race in the lakes. Rebecca's story also includes her involvement with black trail runners where she found community and purpose and she shares her experiences from endure 24 to the three dales marathon in north yorkshire plus rebecca also shares more about why she wanted to participate in challenging races how she builds inner strength and expands her comfort zone she candidly discusses her experiences of training for and running in the mountainous adidas Terex infinite trails race in austria plus how she completed her longest run to date 70 day kilometers on the peak divide running from sheffield to manchester through the peak district which she did one week after her mountainous run in Austria. Incredible episode, well worth listening to. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do hit that subscribe button. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time with bonus episodes going live on a Thursday. If you'd like to support the work that I do, then please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And you can also make a one-off donation via PayPal. All the links are on the website at toughgirlchallenges.com. Thank you again for listening. And all that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it, believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon.